Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 13th annual Robert H. Gow QC Memorial Debate, which is being held for the first time in Allard Hall. <laughs> I no longer feel nostalgic when I come out here. <laughs> uh, my name is Richard Olson. I'm your master of ceremonies. Um, I won't tell you anything about myself other than to relate a remark made by one of the tryout debaters um, <clears throat> in November. And he described me when he went through the judges trying to ingratiate himself. He described me as being one of the creatures from Dante's seventh circle of hell appearing <laughs> in human form. I was quite impressed at the scope of his research. He'd obviously talked to former colleagues of mine. <laughs> I would first like to welcome and introduce our panel of distinguished judges. First of all, the Honorable Lance Finch, Chief Justice of British Columbia. The Honorable Austin Cullen, Associate Chief Justice of the BC Supreme Court. The Honorable Judge Harbins Dillon, British Columbia Provincial Court. John Hunter QC, past president of the Law Society of British Columbia. Stephen McPhee QC, BC branch of the Canadian Bar Association. Jerry LeCoven QC, a representative of Small. And Owen James from Fraser Milner Cascrain LLP. I'd like to thank this evening the sponsors of the Guile Debate, the tryouts, and this evening's reception. Fraser Miller Cascrain LLP have become the generous sponsors for this evening's reception. Bullhauser and Tupper LLP have sponsored the tryouts for a number of years, including last November's. The Friends of Bob Guile for setting up the prize fund for this event at its inception, and the Faculty of Law at Allard Hall for continuing its support. The Law Students Society, and a special thanks to Adam Freud, Claire Half, and Anthony Oliver for their work in supporting this event and finding sponsors. Our MC Emeritus, Wally Lightbody, who drove all the way down from Kelowna to be here tonight. For a blizzard. Apparently it's snowing in the east. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to mention the late Wally Beck, our longtime drummer. And tonight's drummer, Mike Berger. And most importantly, the organizer, ringmaster, and coach, Professor Liz Edinger, who organizes the tryouts and coordinates tonight's event as she has for many years. Liz? Okay, now before we begin the debate, I just want to say a few things about uh, Bob Guile. He's one of those characters uh, in law and in the practice of law who uh, represented some of the qualities of a generation that is now slowly disappearing into history, with all due respect to those who number themselves amongst his generation. The event is held in his honor to recognize and remember Bob but also to celebrate humor and camaraderie in the practice of law, which are two very important aspects that are often overlooked. Uh, now, the practice of law, I think, is an interesting one. It's the only pres uh, profession I can think of that divides the world into two groups, lawyers and non-lawyers. Now, I've never heard anybody talk about a non-plumber or a non-accountant <laughs> or a non-aircraft pilot, but lawyers, we like to divide things up. Bob Gow was an interesting character. He was born in Prince George in 1932, and he died at a relatively young age of 62 in December 1994. His widow passed away two years ago, and his son, uh, Brenton, has also died since he passed away. But he's now survived only by his daughter, Virginia, and his son, Gregory. During his career, he exemplified many qualities and attained many distinctions. He was a partner at Russell and Dumala for many years, which is where I met him when I articled. He was a bencher for many years and master treasurer in 1990. That position has now blandly been renamed president of the Law Society, but I suppose the Law Society thought the treasurer conju conjured up those images of lawyers heading home with wheelbarrows of cash, and they ought to um, fall into line by calling it president. Although I suspect that originally the treasurer of a Law Society was the person who kept the drinking money. <laughs> 
But calling it president does make it sound rather ordinary. But Bob was anything but ordinary. He was a serious and scholarly lawyer, but he was also an incorrigible prankster along with his great pal, the late Tony Pantages QC. Bob was a founder of Small, along with Jerry LeCoven, who's one of our judges today. Um, and Small um, has two different uh, uh, names. One, uh, the original name, I believe, was Society, and Jerry may correct me if I'm wrong, but who cares? Uh, Society, of, <laughs> Society of Midgets, Alliance of Little Lawyers, but later they tried to make it sort of vaguely bilingual and call it Society Mijit, Alliance of Little Lawyers. <laughs> But it's essentially a self-help group for short lawyers with a complex. <laughs> Small lobbied for booster cushions and stools in the courtroom, among many other amenities. <laughs> and uh, one of the other ringleaders of Small was, uh, as I said, Tony Pantages. And the two of them orchestrated many pranks. They often featured in the Russell and Dumoulin Christmas skits. In my year, there was a skit involving Tweedle Bob and Tweedle Tony as they sat on a wall and uh, told each other jokes. Now, Bob was a very talented guy. Uh, he did lots of things. Another one of his talents was making trophies. And he made trophies for all kinds of uh, Russell and Dumal events, including the ski competition. And one of the <coughs> trophies he made, which I really liked, was the Most Dangerous Skier Award, which consisted of a ski glove impaled by the end of a ski pole which was given out to one of the deserving members of the firm every year. Uh, and we're carrying on that tradition, as we have for the last couple of years. And we'll be awarding one or two more uh, individual trophies, as well as the main trophy, which is <coughs> carved out of the side of a mountain. <laughs> now, while we have a serious profession, there, there's room for a bit of humor in it. Um, for those of you about to embark on a legal career, if you do counsel work, there's one basic rule, that if a judge says something that you think is meant to be funny, it is funny. <laughs> and so, that's an important lesson to learn. <clears throat> now, some years ago, I was doing a trial uh, before uh, Chief Justice Bowman, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight because he's ill. Uh, he was then a puny judge of the Supreme Court. Um, and he remarked uh, while I was, uh, after I had uh, made a transposition of numbers in a rather tedious cross-examination of a witness, I had said 78 instead of 87, and he remarked to me that uh, one day, Mr. Olson, you'll refer to that as a senior's moment. <laughs> and if there are any non-lawyers in the audience, uh, the term uh, puny judge uh, is not a description of the height or any other attributes, physical or otherwise, the judge but it means in lawyeries, non-Chief Justice. It's part of our desire to break the world into two parts. Um, <clears throat> there was another occasion in court, uh, Madam Justice Southern, when she was sitting as a Supreme Court judge in chambers, uh, had counsel commence an application along these lines. My lady, this is an unusual application. It's an appeal under the Commercial Tenancy Act from the decision of a county court judge. Her ladyship remarked, Yes, that comes from the days when county court judges were either stupid or drunk. <laughs> she then went on to observe that that wasn't currently the case. And counsel, um, demonstrating the quick wit that you need as counsel, uh, replied that he wasn't relying on either of those grounds. And after a moment, and after her ladyship stopped laughing, because she actually found it funny, he got on with it. Now, the tryouts that I attended in November demonstrate that the bell curve is not just a device for marking papers. Tonight, you will see four debaters who represent the stronger side of the curve for the future of the profession. But please do not give up hope. <laughs> for some of the competitors tonight, this may prove to be the highlight of their legal career. <laughs> Although, interestingly, I once saw, I recently saw a newsletter from a mid-sized law firm in which an associate with, was credited with having won the debate. So, evidently, the partners of that firm have never been here. <laughs> now, um, tonight's resolution is, the practice of law is archaic. Uh, the rules are relatively simple. Uh, the first two speakers for pro and con 
have seven minutes each to advance their arguments. The drummer will signal when their time is up. Um, the next two speakers will then have 10 minutes each, and then the first speakers will each have three minutes for a brief rebuttal. The judges will retire to consider their verdict. Um, and I'd like to introduce our four debaters. Speaking for the resolution are Chris Thompson, Glenn Graham, and speaking against the resolution, Kyle Johnson. Taylor Clark. Now, individual awards may be given, as uh, you'll find out what they are if they're awarded when the verdict <laughs> is delivered. There's the uh, the winners will each receive, or together will receive an empty empty envelope with a promise of a check for the prize money of five hundred dollars each later. The losers, who I've been told ought to be referred to as the runners-up, since apparently no one loses anymore. <laughs> but just wait until you lose your first trial and call your client, good news, we were runners-up. <laughs> They'll also receive an empty envelope with a promise of a check for $250 each. In addition, this year we have a new prize, the wonderfully named All Obiter Club. Sounds like they want a clerk in the Supreme Court of Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Offers a $50 prize for the best irrelevant remark. <laughs> now, um, given that we're in the electronic age, if you have any device that makes a noise, sounds, beeps, music, anything like that, please turn it off or turn it to silent. And now <clears throat> I call upon the first debater, Chris Thompson. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, honored judges, future YouTube viewers, who may earn me many tens of cents of advertising revenue. I can edit in laughter, remember that. <laughs> Be it resolved that the practice of law is archaic. I understand that typically the presenters suck up to the judges in an attempt to gain favor. I found a gift the other day that would perfectly match the demographics and interests of any judge. A boxed set of all 195 episodes of Matlock. <laughs> but it costs more than the prize money, so I thought I'd give them what they really need at this point in their careers, extra life. <laughs> I am here. I am here to argue that the practice of law is archaic. Everyone here, from the judges to the teachers to the students, has a deeply held belief to the contrary. These guys have it as easy as speed dating and bountiful. For us, this is going to be more of an uphill battle than that time I tried to explain evolution to the Catholics. They said, come back next time with a slightly better argument. And I said, yes, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> I'd like to start my argument the way all lawyers start their arguments, by looking up seven different definitions of the word archaic and cherry picking the one most suited for my cause. <laughs> of or related to or characteristic of an earlier or more primitive time. In contrast, I looked up the words both old and wise, and all there was was a picture of Stephen Wexler. <laughs> Turns out that when I looked up young, when I looked up young, you find a picture of an unbearded Ben Perrin. <laughs> I don't actually see him here. Did he make it past the ID check? <laughs> but how is the law archaic? We all think the law has evolved from the days when the judges and lawyers had to trudge for 20 miles through rain and snow, uphill both ways, to arrive at courts soaked in sweat and mentally and physically exhausted. Which is exactly how you feel after a David Duff tax lecture. <laughs> and to some degree it has evolved. Courtrooms are now indoors, and judges now drive Audis and BMWs. Oh sorry, you guys are provincial court judges? Kias and Toyotas. <laughs> 
But the system we use is the adversarial system. It's a system that comes to us from ancient Greece, from a time when sea monsters were legitimate hazard. <laughs> a time that people were just starting to get the idea that the earth was round. And a time where thousands were following the story of a virgin woman who somehow gave birth who wasn't Britney Spears. <laughs> but I will admit it was a time that saw the birth of one of the most important legal philosophers of our time, the aforementioned Stephen Wexler. <laughs> and this system fails us in every respect. In contract law, the arguments are mostly smoke and mirrors. We all know whoever has more money and a slicker tongue wins. It's like the Republican primaries. Or the bachelorette. <laughs> Or shooting porn. <laughs> the last time the little guy won, they were inhaling carbolic smoke. Now we're, now we're just blowing it up there. Oh, let's say arguments. <laughs> Tort law. I'm sorry, any branch of law that's named after a French pastry is its own punchline. <laughs> Crusted, bloated, unhealthy, and worst of all, French. <laughs> In criminal law, whoever lies the best wins. And lying's really easy. Any of you can do it. Put on your best straight face, go to Professor Gould, and say how you really appreciate what he's done with the format of Law and Context. <laughs> and most importantly, you love how he scheduled the exam to give you the shortest possible Christmas vacation. <laughs> we need to modernize the law. We need to bring the methods of seeking truth into the 21st century. And I have a suggestion. We should give all the parties vast quantities of our own locally branded truth serum. <laughs> and then just ask them what happened. But in order to do this, you need to get them wasted. And I mean really wasted. More wasted than the money you spent in your reg state textbook. Really, Iman Montgomery Publications Limited, from fresh off the presses to out of date in eight months. <laughs> what, did you finally get Voldemort's magic snake to translate for Stephen Harper? <laughs> we need to cast off the shackles of our legal history. We need to take the procedural plastic off the grandparents' sofa of ancientness. The system is sending us down a garden path. Think about it. This system came from the Greeks. And look at what's happening in Greece right now. <laughs> Whether or not you believe these Grecians earned their fate. Oh. I spot a 100% correlation between countries that gave us law and countries that are experiencing cataclysmic financial upheaval. Yeah, yeah, I hear you crim lawyers among you yammering on about causation. But if you look at my crim mark, I think it's pretty obvious that I don't care about causation. <laughs> And you know what else the Greeks gave us that will cause the downfall of our legal civilization? The Olympics. The law school tried it, quite recently. I think we all realize what happens when you get a bunch of law students together to join in the spirit of competition. And also what happens when you give free alcohol to French people. You all thought the Olympics had evolved from the, day, from the original days when they were done by drunk and naked men, but anyone who hung around with the Quebecers knows otherwise. Not even the professors emerged unscathed. Listen to the drunken voicemail Professor Duff left on my phone. Let's see if I can get this here. You're sexy and you know it. screwed up. <laughs> Although, I have to say that the video I took is going to make me a lot of blackmail money someday. <laughs> At the end of the day, we still have the eons old adversarial system. A system that pits two parties against each other. And it's not even a fair fight. It's not the prosecution's job to win, but to see that justice is done. And it's the crim defense attorney's job to tuck their conscience into a little time capsule and get their client off no matter what. This is not modern or educated. <laughs> this is primal behavior, and it's all summed up by the motto of the criminal defense attorney. And I quote, I don't care who you are, 
where you're from, what you've done, as long as you pay me. Thank you. These are their times, so they prepared for these. Okay, so you said seven and seven, oh, okay. so they prepared. Okay. Kind of speechless after that one. I'm sure one day he'll make a great professor in another faculty of the university. Uh, we'll now have the first debater, Con, and I misspoke. Apparently, he gets 10 minutes, so he can ramble on a little longer than Chris. Uh, Glenn Grand. <laughs> We're changing the order up here. So I'm con for 10 minutes. <laughs> Is this counting as time? Good evening. So it's almost six o'clock on a Friday and you're all on campus. Hello, you cheap alcoholics. <laughs> Welcome to the geriatric debate. Here we are, bunch of e-harmony matches to the Golden Girls. <laughs> and guys, I'm taking Blanche. You know, a special thank you to Glenn for joining us. God knows how hard it must have been to come out of your crypt. <laughs> If anyone thought UBC Law was a cool and sexy place to study, we sure kill that notion. <laughs> I mean, look at me. I'm getting a belly. I'm getting sort of bald er. <laughs> but worst of all, my mind has been turning into a, a sludge. So judges, how do you handle it? <laughs> no. To be serious, we're honored you could be here. You know, I bet you have a great list of achievements. In fact, my colleague Taylor copied down that list earlier today. It's in here. Uh, this can't be right. It says, chain smoking dowager. I think, dude, this is for Justice Southern. Well, we'll move on. <laughs> Is the practice of law archaic? The answer is staring right at you. <laughs> we are the new faces of law. You know, you might lump us into a category of four old creaky white dudes, but if you got to know us, you'd see that under these robes, we have differences. For example, <laughs> you don't believe me? Okay. For example, can you tell that I've been the subject of a bris? <laughs> I'll give the ladies a moment to save this image for later. It's a big image. Um, my point is, you can't judge a book by its cover, or its lack of cover. <laughs> so let's be wary of making distinctions between young and old, archaic and contemporary, between a joke that's witty and a joke about my wee-wee. <laughs> you know, it's all perspective. Now, you people look smart. At least the first few rows do. So, I won't offend your intelligence and good looks like my rugby goon friend did here. <laughs> oh. Your, your minds deserve to be blown away. So, ready for it? Now, it's not funny, so drummer boy, put down your sticks, you know, grab a pen, copy this down. You know, I'm gonna hit you with science. So Einstein theory of relativity. And here it is. The practice of law is not archaic. We are just too modern. See, not funny. The smart people did not laugh there. 
<laughs> so in a nutshell, we are so modern, our frame of reference is out of whack. And we are on a beeline express bus to the future, whereas the law moves at a different pace. <laughs> I, I think our timing was off there, you know. <laughs> you know the timing is the key to comedy and the bedroom. Um, and my girlfriend just hopes my timing's better here tonight than last night. Um, anyway, where was I? Oh, I was here. The, the, the law is going at its own pace. It's, it's like uh, Gregor Robertson on his bike in his bike lane. You know? He looks slow to us. And by slow, I mean physically and mentally. You know, most of the time we want the bus to swerve and smack him off his happy planet. But I think we could agree that deep down, Mr. Mayor and law practitioners want what's best for all cronies. <laughs> so we expect everything to go as fast as us. You know, instant winners, instant results. I hear there's an iPhone app for a pregnancy test. <laughs> I don't know how it works. I guess you pee on your phone. <laughs> you know, so by comparison, we view the legal system as slow. You know, more and more, we are hearing about cameras in the courtroom. Chief Justice, you're already set for that. You got a great stage name. Honorable Lance Finch. You couldn't have chosen better. You know, you got the whole to kill a mockingbird thing going there. Finch. <laughs> Who else? Justice Dillon. Dillon. Well, we'll work on that. Okay. <laughs> Technology has changed the practice of law. Lawyers have their own web pages. So if I've been charged, I can go online, type in a search, and find myself a defense lawyer. It's kind of like what I do when I'm searching for some late night companionship. <laughs> you know, you might be surprised at the, sorry, at the similarities between a defense lawyer and an escort. They both call me client. <laughs> the good ones will meet you any time of day. <laughs> and hopefully, with both of them, I'll get off in the end. <laughs> so we have cameras in the courtroom. We're Googling your lawyer. And trying to keep up with us, the law has lost some of its mojo. You know, whatever happened to the death penalty? You know, it used to be you and a jury of your peers could go out and enjoy a good public stoning. <laughs> now, to see someone get stoned, you have to go to my colleague Taylor's place. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hire him as your clerk. <laughs> he's, got, he's got good weed. <laughs> you know. All right, what else? Um, we got rid of trials by fire. Just think how happy that made witches. You know, they could be everywhere now, flying their brooms, leading the BC Liberals. <laughs> you know, I would say more, but I'm afraid of being turned into a newt by someone high up at the law school. <laughs> we live in an age of relativity. Law practice has transformed along with our concept of time. Today, as a lawyer, you break up your day into six-minute increments. <laughs> there was a time when your whole year was divided into four terms. Oh, is it Michaelmas? Don't know, buddy. Go ask a druid. <laughs> In England, they still have those terms. What do you expect from them? Their country is run by inbreds. <laughs> In Canada, an inbred is what we name our law schools after. <laughs> Now, you heard about Osgood, haven't you? <laughs> so the practice of law begins with the study of law, so I'll say a few things about where we are now. This Mad Max Thunderdome, you know. I've been waiting for Tina Turner to come flying down here. We have Chris Master Blaster Thompson already. <laughs> you know, the study of law is modernized. It's changing the way we learn. You know, there are classes by video conferences and PowerPoints. And by the way, professors, students love to get PowerPoints. It lets us sleep in. <laughs> Judges, you might have had a chance to see the library. 
They call it a library, but I think they ought to call it what it really is. Book storage. <laughs> you know, it's a 21st century library. Great airflow, wide open spaces, which makes it so that from anywhere in the library, you can hear the toilet flush. <laughs> you know, flush after flush. Sometimes it's like intermission at a hockey game up there. <laughs> well, I can't wait to get out of here and become a lawyer. And I say that even know, though, knowing what a high-pressure job it is. Because nowadays, there are programs to help lawyers. The Bar Association has set up an alcoholic line. There's also a Coke line, you know. So my question is, where does the line form? You know, they better not run out before uh, me and Taylor get called to the bar. And I'm just kidding. He ain't getting called. <laughs> to sum up, the law moves at its own pace. That does not make the practice of law archaic. You know, Einstein would agree with me. Where it has tried to keep up with our modern trends, you know, there have been mixed results. It's kind of like when grandma puts on a bikini. <laughs> Unless your grandma's Blanche from the Golden Girls. <laughs> because I got a thing for her. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry I messed up his introduction, although it was probably a good thing after having heard him. <clears throat> Uh, now we'll introduce the real Glenn Grand, who hopefully <laughs> can demonstrate uh, that he will not need. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready to roll. In the beginning, Gould created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, A, and void in contract, and darkness was upon the face of the peeps, and the spirit of Gould rose upon the face of the law, and Gould said, let there be facts, and he called Harris to check the facts, and Harris saw the facts, that they were good. And from this origin unfolding as it should, the universe spewed forth its conventions and forms, its dockets and registers and doctrines and norms. In archaic Latin and in cold hard cash, the celestial law gods hid a secret law stash. They locked the answers away in a stagnant account, neath the temple of the accrued amount. <laughs> A few eons later, as creation demanded, downtown Van City is where justice landed. And on the first down under day at this sacred site, the almighty Gould performed his first earthly rite. He took some dirty old clay and some old rancid cream, and he fashioned the very few first human, the Cullen Supreme. <laughs> he stood back and wondered at the work of his hand and puzzled by something he could not understand. He said, this one turned out like some abstract Phoenician. He'll need intravenous of Botox and formula of Grecian. <laughs> Christ, he's already as old as the Jurassic accretion. I must make something younger, not quite as hostile, with four eyes and real hair and wider of nostril. He groped and he grasped, but the supplies were now rare, having wasted most on the old Cullen fake hair. Suddenly, a sharp bite in his ass made the great one yelp. He heard a voice hiss, maybe I can be of help. For as in all great myths, even the Goulds have their foil, the dread Vexer Wexler began to uncoil. <laughs> he said, I have the liquefied bones of alumni dead. Why don't you use some of my stuff instead? It's my premium brew, a delightful elixir. It came, contains intestines of Pavlich and Duff Dandruff for fixer. <laughs> Together they stirred a hot cauldron of horror. Then arose a great thunder and flash and a freakish hell roar. Wexler commanded, stand back, you dumb jerk. I need to add some fresh blood of court clerk. 
The university seized, the galaxies trembled, the cauldron ringed by the demon faculty who'd assembled, and as the rosy red drop fell into the soup, the cullen supreme in terror fled the coop, and Wexler vexed into Gould's ear he hissed, my chaos will smash your empirical gist. All present stared shocked, their gaze on the kettle, bearing witness to this mad alchemy of mayhem and metal. Wexler cried, look at your boy run, this ought to be a cinch. And out of the black frothy sledge spawned the demon king of the underworld, Lance Finch. <laughs> what the face Gould had envisioned, but with terrible detachments. The Wexler sorcery added new hellish attachments. Dragon wings loomed from the finch demon's back. Gigantic balls of pus hung in the place of his sack. He spewed fire mumbo and lightning jumbo in some collateral freakish gibberish hell attack. The towering monster shrieked with a cry that ripped through Gould's brain. But what shook him the most was Wexler's final claim. When he did thus the fate of humankind reveal, your chicken Cullen is no longer supreme. My demon Finch shall rule with his appeal. In one acrid flash, the serpent with his minions departed, but now the earth wobbled, a miss in the abyss of the imbalance he had started. Almighty Gould swore a fierce incantation. If I cannot stop that beast, then my fate be damnation. With his bruised ego in tow, to the halls of Val Allard he departed. <laughs> To the pro bono room where the real work started. In dark secrecy, so the legend goes, he brewed his own serum using old Wexler prose. He started with a base of anomaly dust and added remedy civil and chancery must and a secret ingredient of just, don't ask. He debated with his own fascinating mind, struggling for answers no god could find. He muttered while he worked, it cannot be fate and yet perhaps it is. What is the meaning? Is law just a pop quiz? Why must humans quarrel? Is a rule a rule even if it's not moral? I cannot decide. Into madness I will fall. Maybe we should just use dice and say fuck it all. <laughs> he baked like a baker god, baking god bread in his kitchen. Tired of listening to his own constant bitching. In a blur of holy fingers and holy writ dough, he formed his next human image. This one is a bit slow. He could not shut up and he carried on and on and on. The only name I can think of for him, said Gould, is Hunter, John. He's none too quick, but he has the right feel. And I've added to him some scat from the dunghill of appeal. He tasked his Hunter John thus, make ye haste to the temple of the accrued amount and there keep a watch on the earth's trust account. It has become a haunt for the unborn souls that I made to dismount. For his final creation, he withheld the gray bowman grizzle and set to work chiseling the chin of this one with his almighty chisel. He patiently crafted his most deviant of creatures, the Archangel McPhee with the McPretty Boy McFeatures. He was the first god to solicit hand jobs in the bleachers. What? At the temple of the accrued amount, the finch demon in battle they did meet to trim those crazy batshit wings and cut him off at his corny old feet. On the site of arrival, they froze in dismay and shock. The temple had turned to juridified rock. Soon a pitch battle raged and the finch demon was winning. Battered and bloody, Gould and pretty boy were in the throes of death, spinning. All was lost in this unnatural scene. When to the rescue came, the Cullen Supreme. Here at the end of all things, when fate left no choice. Now he was old and fat and soft. He had at last found his voice. He cried. Fiat justitia calum ruid ad infinitum turpi nauseum ex cranium rectum, ex cranium rectum. <laughs> Surprised and stunned by the eccentric banter, the finch demon wobbled, his tiny brain was all a canter. And below his yellow toes formed a great sudden pit. It was Hunter, John, springing the holy trap of audit. Oh shit, cried the demon, not the pit of audit. The Almighty regrouped, he and Pretty Boy charged, and they cast the demon down to roam forever at large in the tormented sludge hole and the old tepid stench to add his name to the Court of Queen's bench. <laughs> this old story, it's beyond archaic. In fact, it's eternal. It's the old boys club, prosaic and fraternal. And what of that temple in downtown Van City? Well, I hate to reveal, but the end is not pretty. Atop the rubble now sits a kosher delicatessen. 
The gods finally taught that old relic a lesson. <laughs> the cherubs turned pale and the gargoyles are all bland and the pillars of stone just went back into sand. Though his methods were astray, like the vexer Wexler on that terrible day, we must cast this archaic law away. Roll those bones. Challenge our circumstance. It's not simply luck. We should give a fuck and take a chance. We can't be any higher in price. What's the harm in having a little paradise? Excranium rectum. Excranium rectum. interesting ways of attempting to ingratiate yourself with your judges. <clears throat> I'm sure that he will be joining me in the seventh circle. Uh, and now we have, last and probably least, the second debater, Con, uh, the aforementioned uh, Taylor Clark. Please? Hey, come on, I'm the headliner. <laughs> I'm the Tom Jones of debate. I deserve more applause than that. <laughs> and the flying panties. <laughs> For the record, I did not pay them. No, they're my wives, so it's a good thing Justice Bauman's not here. Uh, and hey, how about a, a small round of applause for my opening acts, Chris, Glenn, and Kyle. <laughs> smaller, smaller. You know what, just stop. What was that, Glenn? You're not supposed to upstage the headliner. Anyway, it is really fantastic to be here tonight. This is the first Guile debate ever held at the center of Palpatine Hall. In this three-story multi-purpose forum, don't let the ongoing construction fool you. This law school is fully operational. <laughs> it's capable of destroying entire planets with a single energy beam. <laughs> and you know, law students, we love to complain, but I think I'm starting to like the new building. It may be Kafkaesque, and it's literally a glass house. <laughs> but if there's one thing this building isn't, it's archaic. As Dean Brooks has said before, one of the most innovative aspects of the new building is the extent to which its construction has been financed privately. It seems like every room has a name attached to it. <laughs> FMC, you guys have a really nice room in the library. Too bad it's closed to students 21 hours a day. <laughs> and Justice Finch, I see you're on the donors list, but I can't find a single room with your name on it. <laughs> that's, that's why, on, on behalf of the Dean, uh, I'd like to take a moment and offer you naming rights to one of my favorite rooms. Uh, it's the basement showers. <laughs> the showers, by the way, are multi-purpose too. In fact, the whole basement is pretty much a bathhouse. <laughs> Which is why you bring extra panties to law school. <laughs> listen, listen, Lance. I know Mrs. Justice Finch holds the purse strings. Maybe we can get her name on there, too. Anyway, we'll talk later, kick around some numbers. Um, we will. I, that's... Anyway, in the spirit of Allard Hall, my Guile debate speech is also funded privately. I'd like to welcome you to the Thorst and Sinsense, um, Thorst, the speech against calling the practice of, arc, of law archaic. Thornstein and Sons. Hope you like tax. 
Now, there are some laws that you might think are archaic. In Canada, we have a law against fraudulently pretending to practice witchcraft. <laughs> Hold on a minute, you say. That's not fair to Dean Babinski. <laughs> but you have to understand that fraudulent witches were a very prevalent problem at the time, like terrorists. You can't repeal that law. Somebody would fly a broomstick into the CN Tower. Also, ain't nothing fraudulent about the Dean's sorcery. That joke was brought to you by BHT. <laughs> We're on the 30th floor, suckers. <laughs> Name calling, that's all this debate is really about. And I would expect that kind of thing from a beef-witted barbarian like Chris Thompson. <laughs> he thinks he's so tall. <laughs> I'm sure he'd just love it if we replaced the practice of law with rugby or Greco-Roman wrestling. <laughs> but you know, somehow I expected more from Glenn. Glenn, shouldn't you be a QC by now? <laughs> no, he's old, but Glenn, <laughs> he is. See, well, there's no denying it, you know, because you got to call a spade a spade sometimes. Glenn may be, he may be very, very, very old, <laughs> but, there's a but, but he has the mind of a child. <laughs> and then there's Kyle. Kyle is the worst of all. He's nothing but an oxygen thief. A genetic wasteland. The worst kind of... Wait, wait, Kyle, you're on my team. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away there, buddy. Uh, what I meant to say was, good work, Kyle. <laughs> anyway, that's exactly why I'm not going to engage in name-calling. <laughs> Byron Shelley over here wants to say that the practice of law is archaic. Does he even know what that word means? It means obsolete, useless. In short, it's a hurtful word. You can't just throw it around as a substitute for a mode of disapproval, like you do with slut or gay. That joke was brought to you by Owen Bird Law Corporation. We hire women. Reluctantly. I hope, I hope you guys get my job application this summer. Lawyers are the pillars of society. The hoi polloi look to us for moral guidance. Clients walk into a law office in 20, 2012. They expect much more than just winning a case. Clients today expect a lawyer to have volunteered in Africa, campaigned for human rights, and quietly wept for the bleak existence of the downtown east side. And you, young master Shakespeare, would besmirch this noblest of professions. I bite my thumb at thee, sir. <laughs> that joke was brought to you by Alanis Morissette. <laughs> Isn't it ironic? <laughs> see, where's my third page? Ah, here we go. Without rules, you have anarchy. Is the practice of law old? Sure it is. But is it any older than masturbation? <laughs> the fact is, some things never get old. <laughs> that joke was brought to you by FMC. <laughs> Thanks for the drinks, FMC. A few more of these, and even your firm might start to look good to me. <laughs> Kyle, can you pick up these panties for me? Or did you miss one? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentle persons, the practice of law is not archaic. And the evidence is in this very room. I'm talking, of course, about the fact that this place is packed with girls. <laughs> Today, more than half of you see law students are female. Now, since girls are nothing if not creatures of fashion, they would not flock to the practice of law if it had gone out of style. Unless they're hipsters. Either way, <laughs> ipso facto, the practice of law is not archaic. Uh, seriously, I hope some of you guys will try out for this debate next year. I don't want to get stuck with Kyle again. <laughs> Oh.
Well, Taylor, you ought not to waste stamps on a number of firms sending your resume out. <laughs> because they do look at YouTube. All right, and now the uh, first debater pro has three minutes for rebuttal. I guess that's uh, Chris Thompson. Our opponents began by stating that we are the eHarmony matches for the Golden Girls. And he says he takes Blanche. I argue it's because he doesn't have the experience for Betty. <laughs> he also made extended references to Einstein's law. One of my favorite laws of Einstein is that light travels faster than sound, which is why people look intelligent until you hear them. They argue the law is more modern. A characteristic of something is mo that's modern is that it's faster, smaller, lighter, better, more dependable, more breathable, and cheaper than it was in the past. Like computers, cars, kitchen appliances, iPods, stereos, cell phones, clothes, and just about everything we buy. Law, on the other hand, is slower, more expensive, more complicated, and more difficult to understand than it used to be. <laughs> but I will admit, not guilty verdicts are a lot easier to buy now than they were in the past. <laughs> I think that's why the tax court judges drive the fancy cars. <laughs> Change is not evolution. They argue that the law changes. I say it does too, but it does not evolve. Regulators find creative, inventive ways to give new names to crimes and statutes and institutions. But how many times can you reword things? Minister of National Revenue, Revenue Canada, Canada Revenue Agency. They all come from the original Latin, clamat tibi sint inconvenientia, which means your deductions are unreasonable. <laughs> Moreover, change for the sake of change is wasteful. How many of our statutes end up in the Great Pacific garbage patch, suffocating dolphins with their superfluous verbiage? How many of our statutes, statutes end up in a third world landfill being picked over for the, by the characters from Slumdog Millionaire? This change for the sake of change is a huge waste of resources. They argue you can get the law online. Well, you can. But do you think it's really good that you get the law from the same place you get your porn? <laughs> I was doing some research. A recent UBC survey ranked website use during class. Number one, Facebook. Number two, YouTube. Number three, PornTube. Number four, get Dimitri to stop smoking.com. Where is Dimitri? I told you I'd give you a punchline. And number five, LexisNexis. They didn't say much of anything else, so I'm done. <laughs> and now it is my sad and unfortunate duty to call upon um, Taylor Clark again for his very brief three, mu three minutes rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Dion. You guys are lucky. I don't usually do encores, especially for free shows. <laughs> anyway, there shouldn't be any dissenting opinions tonight. Look at this lineup of debaters. It's like the ascent of man. <laughs> Actually, so is the lineup of judges. Still, if any of you are on the fence, come up here and fondle Kyle's testicles. <laughs> Everything I know about judges, I learned from dog shows. My friends, in calling it archaic, you're not just denigrating the practice of law, but the law itself. You're saying that these eminent judges are as obsolete and useless as cave painters, log drivers, and video store clerks. <laughs> well, I won't stand for it, Chris and Glenn. And as for rebuttal, well, we've all listened to my opponent's arguments, except for Kyle. He's old and hard of hearing. <laughs> Still, that's better than Glenn. What was that anyway, Glenn? The second coming of Dr. Zeus? <laughs> Good luck in your first year moot. God help your partner. <laughs> and Chris, I didn't know Professor Duff was on your team. <laughs> now, Chaucer here probably thinks that legal costs are getting out of control. But think about all the free beer we've been getting. 
Thanks again, FMC. Your client's money well spent. <laughs> but what's the alternative? Without astronomical legal costs, you're going to have poor people clogging up the system, like so much human detritus. <laughs> Justice Bauman's not here today, but I believe he gave a speech about this topic recently in Las Vegas. <laughs> I do have a lot of respect for my opponents. If things were different and I didn't get stuck with Kyle, maybe we could have been friends. <laughs> Speaking of Kyle and me, obviously we've put on a great show tonight. But I do want to stress the fact that we're still the underdogs in this thing. Kyle is a social leper who collects women's underwear. <laughs> and me, I'm, I'm, I'm just a transfer student from Dow. They wouldn't have even let me pl uh, participate in this debate last year. When you think about it, it's kind of a Cinderella story. <laughs> And here we are at the end of that story. And I just want to go back to my previous point where I was talking to all the ladies in the crowd. <laughs> um, so why have attention? Uh, I just want to say I currently have no plans for later tonight. <laughs> my number is uh, it's 604. Wait, hang on, does everybody have a pen? <laughs> you, get one from her. Uh, okay, so it's, it's 604. It's, actually, you know what? I'm in the middle of a debate here. Just get my digits from uh, Justice Finch. <laughs> or, actually, if you want to cut out the middleman, meet me downstairs in the Lance Finch shower. <laughs> well, I don't want to go over time again, so I guess that concludes my rebuttal. Judges, since I know you're curious, I am available for children's parties, clerkships, <laughs> and other social functions. I'm sure when Taylor graduates, he'll be able to find a job cleaning his favorite showers downstairs. <laughs> now, um, having heard the debates, the judges are now going to retire for a few minutes to consider their verdict and consider some of the uh, special awards we have to some of the debaters, which are deserving. We'll reconvene um, when you hear the big drum roll. Um, so if the judges like to retire, we'll reconvene when they're done. Thank you.